Hey, aloha everyone. Michelle Melendez with Blossom Inner Wellness and StandTogetherHawaii.com. Super excited about that one. Lots of things going on here on the Big Island and all the islands. Uh, the anniversary for the Great uh, Maui Fire is coming up uh, this Thursday. I do have written the Great Maui Land Grab book, which is sold many, many copies around the world. Super excited about that. If you haven't gotten your copy yet, you can get it at greatmauilandgrabbook.com, greatmauilandgrabbook.com. It is my pleasure and privilege to actually speak to the sponsor of this channel, John J. Singleton, Ace of Coins. He's with Ace of Coins. Today, we're going to be talking about well, first of all, if you haven't gone to aceofcoins.com, you should go because he has methods on how to lower or and eliminate your taxes, how to buy Bitcoin tax-free, how to license your biometric data of your face, your image that is being used by big tech. He definitely is a, a guided angel here on the planet right now and in this time in history. So, John, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Michelle. So today we're going to be talking about the um, your journey toward taking the IRS to court through federal to federal court and winning. This is huge. Well, the best way if you're in that situation, if you have to be, is not to be the plaintiff. I've never been able to sue them and, and get anywhere because of sovereign immunity. And there's really no cause for that anyway. It's you, you're in the wrong path if you're suing the government. It's better if they sue you. Right. It shifts the burden of proof. And uh, you actually have a very good advantage if you're the defendant against the United States, especially wow. when it comes to the IRS. Yeah. So, you know, that makes yeah. sense because it is the burden of proof. And even though they and, and they can really snake through even the smallest little cracks. But so what what's the story here? Well, there's some truths that that never get revealed because the government doesn't sue enough people. If the government sued enough people and people just understood some basic procedure, uh, the whole system would change. You'd have a better system. You'd have a fairer system. The, the way they get away with it now is they have all these, like, what do you call it, tricks, tax court, mm -hmm. the assessment process, which is fake, you know, all these things. And so I just happen to know how it works. And I love the opportunity if my clients don't love it, but. I love the opportunity to have a case where the client gets sued. You know, when they call me on the phone and say, I'm getting sued by the United States, I'm like, oh, great. Send the pleading over. I can't wait to read it, you know, <laughs> uh, because, well, yeah. It's, it's because, also is because the whole thing's a sham. The whole yeah. entire country is a business, not country, but government is an absolute sham. That's my chance to take a whack at them. You know, because they have the burden of proof and they're a bunch of liars. And they're mm. not on not this not that they're just liars, they're actually incompetent. If you can't beat them and you can read, you did something wrong. Maybe you owe them, you know. <laughs> but uh if you know, if you can read and uh, you can beat them. Because a lot of times they're just lying. Right? So so let's talk about this first. Let's talk about what the IRS is, who the IRS is. They're not even in the United States. They're in that Puerto Rico. Is that, that correct? Well, Look at it this tell way. us. But to, right. people who have never understood like the IRS and the whole word IRS freaks them out. What would you say to them around the right. IRS? Whatever it is, are? whether whether it's a a corporation or a government agency, it in, in any way it does the accounting for the United States. It's vital and necessary to have that happen. If it's not going to be the IRS, it's going to be somebody else. Ernst and Young. It's going to be somebody else. But why are they not? In the United States, there's a reason why they're not even established in the United States. They're actually established well, in Puerto Rico. So that that whole company right. had to move out of the United States. I don't know. It's irrelevant. I don't see how that factors into anything. The government needs an accounting function. You, you Correct. You can't run a country without it. So it's either going to be the IRS or somebody else. Here's what you guys don't like about the IRS. The Congress gave it the police power. Mm -hmm. It's still an accounting firm. So imagine giving an accounting firm the right to arrest you. Well, that's what we have a problem with, because that's being used and it's being used in an abusive way in many cases. Or let's say we give it the right to just take your stuff and then you have to work it out later. You, they don't have to sue you first. That's why I say whenever the, they have to sue you first, so there are cases where they have to sue you first. And I love those cases because I get to, I get to expose the crap, right? So I don't, you know, I don't know about the IRS being out of the country and all this stuff. It doesn't matter. It's an accounting function. 
It's yeah, it is an accounting function, but my, my point was with that is that it's not part of the government. It's actually part of the, um, and, and I don't really want to go into this topic because I want to get into your story about what happened with you. But my, my point is, is that the banking elites did take over the, in, in 1913, did create the IRS. They, they're not part of the government. That was my point is that the, and you're right about an accounting system, but the constitution gave Congress the right to print money that they gave then to the IRS, the banking elite families to then print money to literally screw the whole system up because we actually pay on the principal, not even on the debt, which is a whole nother topic. But let's talk about your issue. First of all, what was your issue that got you into federal oh. court? And I had so I had a, a, a couple, a, a rich couple. Okay, they have lots of money, and so they had done some foolish things in setting up legal structures outside the country. And when I asked them why they did that, they said, "Well, we were just moving money over there from the states." And I'm like, "Well, I was thinking, why? You're just creating, you're bringing more attention to yourself. To what end? If you already have the money and you have the ability to spend it, why would you just move it into another jurisdiction? You're going to get the attention of." Financial Crimes Network, not the IRS. They could care less. So the Financial Crimes Network was their problem because they didn't disclose their relationship to the banking system over there, wherever country it was. They had like a um, dozen companies. They spent so much money on companies. I had, them, I had them undo everything, I hate to say, but that actually is saving them in the long run. So their deal was with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, which is administered through the IRS. So FinCEN was accusing them of not disclosing their banking activities or certain aspects of it on, on the proper forms. That's where they really trip up a lot of people. So they were in the middle of an audit. That's how I got a hold of it. So because they're in the middle of an audit, it, we luckily we had the audit questions. There was like 90 of them. They were sent to my clients in writing in the mail. So that meant that they can take their time and confer with each other and whoever else they wanted and write up the answers however they wanted and send it back in the mail. <laughs> That's like the best situation if you have to answer questions. And by the way, you do have to answer the questions. An IRS summons is a duty. You got to answer it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you don't, you're not sure about this, go look at the rules of civil procedure under the federal rules of civil procedure, rule 27. I believe the audit summons is under rule 27. This is an action to perpetuate testimony. If you guys don't know what that means, I'll tell you that the rules of civil procedure for federal court allow someone to ask you questions about the possibility of being able to sue you later. But because he doesn't know what he can sue you for, he can ask you questions you have to answer. And then if he discovers how he can sue you, then he can sue you after that. Wow. That's what the IRS is doing, guys. No one's going to tell you this. It's rule 27. Check it out. Wow. In any, in any case, so I understand how this works. I've been looking at this for 30 years. And, and finally, I get a case. I'm like, okay, great. Thank you. And my client get ang my clients get angry. John, why are you saying that? I say, well, there's a really good chance they're going to have to go away and be embarrassed. So I said, but we have to prepare the case. You're being audited. We go, I went ahead and wrote the answers. They didn't like them. I answered truthfully, but I have a way of answering things that they don't like. But they don't know I'm answering them, of course. So I said to him, okay, we're going to answer these questions. They're going to, they're going to squawk and say, you need to come in to an audit in person. Cause, cause you can do an examination. A virus can do an audit without you coming there in person to the office. And that's the scary part is when people, people think an audit is only when you're in front of the IRS in an office building somewhere. No, they do examination changes all the time. And they send you a letter saying, we changed this on your tax return. If you don't agree, do this thing, you know? So in this case, they did this long drawn out process to intimidate my client, I think. So I just, um, I, I coached him and I said, okay, so go to the audit. And I didn't have to represent them. Sometimes I represent people. In this case, I didn't have to. I just, I just sent a letter to the IRS and I said, this is the way it's going to play out. My clients are going to go and they're going to answer all your questions once again. And uh, that's going to be all you get. We're not going again. We're not going to a second meeting. That's mm -hmm. all you get. So make sure that you have all the questions ready because my clients are not going to go. If you think that they're going to go, just get used to it because we're not. And of course, they don't like to hear that. So I said to my clients, here's what's going to happen. Here's what they're going to do. You're going to go to the audit and they're going to ask you the same stupid questions they already answered that we already answered. 
So bring those answers. And when they ask the question, read the answer I wrote. Okay. Okay, so happened. we did that. We did that. But I said, look, we got to add one more thing. So this, guys, look, here's how you deal with the IRS. Don't record them. Don't go. You're wasting your time. Bring a court reporter into the meeting and take the transcript. It will cost you about $500 or $1,000. It's worth every penny. And you'll see when I tell you what happened. So they, my client said, well, gosh, how we have to spend $1,000 on this. I said, I'm sorry, but it's going to cost you about $1,000 to get the transcript of this audit. It's gonna, probably going to take you most of the day. And sure enough, it did. So we get, we get to the whole thing and they said, well, why do we have to have the, the transcript? I said, because these liars don't like being told what to do as long as, you know, you can tell them what to do as long as it's within the scope of the law. If you show that you know your rights, then they don't like it. So yeah. I said, what they're going to do is they're going to file a petition under Rule 27 in the district court to compel you to testify at the audit. And they're going to accuse you of refusing to answer their questions. And they're going to accuse you of using the Fifth Amendment as if that's some sort of crime. Accuse you <laughs> of using Oh, the my Fifth gosh. Amendment. Yeah, you're right. So, so I advise them. I said, do not use the Fifth Amendment. Never, never, never use the Fifth Amendment at an audit. It doesn't apply. The U.S. Constitution does not apply at an IRS audit. Wow. Woo! I know that's, that's going to freak out so much. Well, the people. U.S. Constitution isn't applying anywhere right now, especially it here on the It does govern islands. the IRS, but it doesn't govern the audit. What governs the wow. audit is the rules of civil procedure. You need to know those, not the U.S. Constitution. You don't have a right to privacy because why? You already waived it because you're participating in the tax system. That's why you're getting audited in the first place. <laughs> oh, my already, gosh. Okay, wait. Say that again. Because... You already stepped in the game, okay? You did yes. something to be in the, within the purview of the IRS to get audited. You can't now act like you're not in that system. Mm. Sorry. But you do have remedies and you do have privacy and there's some things you can do that are practical. And I'm, that's why we're doing this. Michelle and I are yeah. you know, We're doing this. So. I took the transcript with a bona fide court reporter, not Uncle Bob, not a tape recorder, not a hidden camera, okay, a transcript from a court reporter. So I had to order the transcript. We got the we got the PDF version or whatever, and then I said, just get the real transcript. Like they send you a book with it. It's all bound and stuff. It's under oath. It's really formal, okay? You want this. And so my clients asked why. And I said, well, here's what's going to happen. These liars are going to go to the district court and they're going to say they're going to try to get an order to compel you to testify under penalty of contempt. They want to put you in jail or they want to threaten you with jail because they want to say that you didn't comply. So never use the Fifth Amendment. They were very good about this. They did not do this at all. They did exactly. I read the whole transcript. They did perfectly what I told them. And I said, give them the same answers we already gave them. And they said, what if they ask us different questions? I said, they're not. And they didn't. Kids are robots. <laughs> They're just button pushers. So we got the transcript. Uh -huh. And a month later, my client sent me an email. So, John, what's happening? Nothing's happening. I said, just wait. <laughs> Two months later, John, what's happening? Just wait. <laughs> Three months uh -huh. later, they get served from the Department of Justice, some, a summons to appear in federal court to show cause why they shouldn't be held in contempt for refusing to comply with an IRS summons. But they yeah. did comply. Yes, and we would have been screwed if we didn't have a transcript showing how we complied because they lied about the manner in which my clients complied. So I had to make a transcript so it becomes part of the record. If you don't make a transcript, you don't have a record. And the judge can't see it. He, she doesn't care what you say. He doesn't care what you say. You have to have the transcript. So we had the transcript. So we filed a motion to dismiss. And we said the pleading filed by the United States government the complaint fails to state a cause of action upon which a relief can be granted. Because, and you have to admit everything in the in the pleading, right? So, and the, the reasons are in there. But basically, what I said was, here's Exhibit A, the transcript. You can read it for yourself, Judge. All the questions were answered. Read the, read the answers. You tell us if you think, Judge, that there's any more you know answers that we can give no problem tell me because they're not going to put you in jail they don't care about they're, they're just trying to scare you they're not going to put you in jail they're just going to say do it or i'll put you in jail right but they're not um so uh then we and so i said you know that at no time was the fifth amendment used was in the motion 
So uh, that's not true. It's not, it's not correct. So it, however you, I don't want to, I don't want to go into the legal aspect of it, but the transcript was the, was the golden egg, so to speak. Okay. Showing that the DOJ was lying and we left him with this one question. As you know, your honor, not only does the transcript show you what happened and it's not what they said, but the U.S. Constitution has nothing to do with an IRS audit. So you guys went to law school. They went to law school. Why are they mentioning it? We didn't. Oh, yeah. You're talking about the Fifth Amendment. So why was that used? In, the Fifth when Amendment it's not? is not something that you can rely upon in an audit for the IRS. Mm -hmm. I know this is going to ruffle a lot of feathers, mm -hmm. but you need to be educated. And this is how powerful it is when you know the law and you know procedure and you know the rules. Here's what I'm talking about. Know the rules, rules of federal federal rules of civil procedure. OK, forget the Constitution, the rules of civil procedure. And I'll just tell you real quick, those rules come out of England in uh, the parliamentary procedure. OK, the Roberts Rules of Order. This is very important to business and everything. It's important to jurisdiction and administrative law. It's so important. Those of you who want to use the Constitution all the time, you don't have a clue about Robert's Rules of Order, parliamentary procedure. Once you understand that, you can beat them left and right. And I'll, yeah. this is the first case now. I'm only talking about the first case. I'm not talking about yet the second case, which also involves parliamentary procedure, rules of civil procedure, okay? So, so I have a question about that, but I want to ask it afterwards. Okay. But go ahead. So within 30 days, the United States government dismissed its own case nice with prejudice sorry we're dismissing the case and we're never coming back so my client didn't even understand what was going on says sends me an email what what does this mean what does it mean <laughs> it well, means you're you're it, it means, means good things it means you just beat the united states <laughs> the full That's huge. of the yes because think about it, the United States has unlimited money, unlimited money, right? Mm -hmm. Unlimited resources, unlimited people. There's no question that it knows the law. Yeah. And all you did was file one document and beat them. And not only did you because, beat them. Because, well, one, they had you and they and you know what the heck well, is going on because the court they, cases are well, well, I mean, crazy. It's, I didn't even go and cite a big, long brief or something. I just said you didn't follow the procedure and you lied. Mm -hmm. And so. And if they yeah. had an attorney, they would have been shafted. Because the attorney's part of this whole system. Attorney, he would have, he would have worked out an arrangement where you go mm -hmm. back and do it all over again, like I told him I wouldn't do in the first place. And they never went back. So the IRS came up with, you know, they, they concluded that the, my clients owed like six hundred thousand dollars. It was like six or seven hundred thousand dollars. And I have to say, if FinCEN, if there's nothing wrong with FinCEN, they owed it. I'm not saying it was it wasn't a debt they didn't owe. Mm -hmm. So they owe the money. You can buy own. I have my understanding of the law, and I think I understand it pretty well. I told my class, I said, "You guys owe the money, but we can run the clock on them, okay? But we got to get past this this quagmire here." So we did. We got past the first part. So I said, "Well, you just beat the United States." So the spoiled brats of the Department of Justice decided that they would bring a new case. So there's a way to state a cause of action, like you can sue someone for like an unpaid bill. You can sue them for a loan. You can take a loan and sue somebody for an unpaid bill. They're kind of interchangeable, but you only get one shot. So if you sue them for an unpaid bill and you lose, you can't come back later and sue them for a loan he didn't pay on the same set of facts. The court's going to say, hey, look, rest judicata. Yeah, right? Yeah. I understand this. You guys understand rest judicata. Okay. I don't understand that, but I know what you just said. What, what is it's already rest been decided. Rest judicata. Oh, okay. It's already been decided. I'm saying I'm speaking to your audience because I know a lot of your followers are they're like, yeah, we know that. <laughs> so, but the court would say we've already we've already decided this. Uh, get out of here. We don't have jurisdiction. You only get one shot. Well, the United States is different, though, because, you know, it has guns and stuff. Yeah, they're special. Yeah, they're special. So the United States brought a new case for this time. Now, remember, OK, the audit case, the complaint to the court for uh, order compelling to, to appear at the audit is for injunctive relief. This means it wants the court to order you to do something or to not do something. It's not asking for money. It was asking for compliance with an order, administrative order, injunctive relief, an injunction. Okay. 
So they brought in a second case, a whole new lawsuit. This is the two cases I'm talking about. The second lawsuit, same defendants. Same clients. Okay. Yep. This time they wanted the same identical set of facts, but this time they wanted all the money and they were suing for the money. And they said, we have these penalties here. And those penalties, let me tell you, they were, they were correct. My clients owe. Most cases they don't owe. In this case, they just happen to owe. The thing is, the way this arrived is that there is no assessment of the taxes. You guys don't know this, but the government doesn't assess taxes. But the only time there's a tax liability is when there's an assessment. Go check the case law. You'll see what I'm talking about. An assessment creates a tax liability, but the government doesn't assess anything because it tricks you into believing you have to file a 1040. That's now, what I was going to say. You, you assess it by yeah, filing you, these... You're still not, you can't do an assessment either. It's not a bona fide assessment, but you're waiving that by filing a 1040. Now, yeah. I'm not, I'm just going to caution everybody. Don't stop filing returns because I just said that. Okay. Just think this through. Think so, it through. Think it through. A, a tax liability is created when the government conducts an assessment and there's certain criteria. There's certain elements that create an assessment. It's not just a piece of paper that says you owe. A notice of levy is not an assessment. There are specific things like, for example, there has to be an assessment officer, someone with that duty, okay? Uh, he has to make a certificate. He has to uh, put the type of tax on the document. It has to be assigned a document locator number. Um, it's basic. This is in every taxing jurisdiction, but I'm just talking about the IRS right now. Um, and there has to be the dollar amount and all this sort of thing, okay? A 1040 is not a tax. It's a form. So there's yeah. no such thing as a 1040 tax. This is where we got them. This is where we got them. So we filed a motion to dismiss and the, the court in 99% of the time. Okay, wait, wait, let, let, me, let me just ask it. Okay. So they're saying you didn't fi file the 1040 tax. That's what they're claiming? No, what they did was okay. they, the, my clients filed. Okay. But but they didn't pay. So, oh, so the government that's... says you have to pay. Now, but this one, this is my point. So okay. you're waiving the assessment obligation by filing a return. It's not an assessment. That's correct. Yes. Uh, technically. So you can't assess yourself that you're not allowed to because it's a government function. It's a function of government. There is no such thing as an assessment by a private citizen. Just like you don't have a private right of action for like uh, indicting someone for a crime, right? Only the government can do that. Right. So anyway, so th they filed the complaint for these damages, $600,000. And I thought, well, that's great because if I can win this case, then that 600,000 becomes big fat goose egg zero. And they okay, get, okay. So what okay, happened? Okay, okay. This is no, awesome. No, no. I'll tell you next week. No. <laughs> no. no. So, so they sued and, and we filed a motion to dismiss. Now, remember, a motion to dismiss administratively, it admits everything. You're admitting the allegations in the complaint, but you're saying that that the pleading itself, the complaint that you admitted to, all the all the allegations in the complaint, it still doesn't give the court the right to hear the case. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And so you, there's, you have to be really understand there's some logic to this. So we look at the pleading and it says the government assessed a tax on this date and the, the defendant owes this much money, assessed a tax, assessed a tax, tax assessment, tax assessment. Okay. You put that in the pleading. These are allegations and you have to prove them. You have to prove that you assessed it. Right. So and now I'm not going to get into the technicals, but here's basically what I did is I like to do this. I like to show how the pleading contradicts itself which I did because you have to keep in mind when you file the motion to dismiss, you're, you're having to admit all the allegations. So once you, so what, what can you say once you admit all the allegations, you have to say something like, yeah, well, all that's true, but the court can't take jurisdiction because in exhibit a, what you said in exhibit a conflicted with your third allegation. You said there was an assessment and exhibit a shows a copy of a, a notice of levy. That's not an assessment. Oh, your allegation goodness. of an assessment referred to exhibit A and I look at exhibit A and it's a RACS report. That's not the assessment. It's a bill. There has to be an underlying debt and the only underlying debt comes from an assessment. So I'm going to ask the court to dismiss it because the court lacks jurisdiction. It fails to state a cause of action, a good reason why the, the court can take jurisdiction in here. You don't have a complaint. That'd be wow. like, that'd be like if you sue the weather, imagine if you sue the weather and, and told the court, Hey, Judge, I want you to order that it shall not rain on Tuesday because, you know, I have a picnic and my friends are coming you, over. 
And you just laugh at you and say, you're nuts. I don't have jurisdiction for that. It's natural law. I can't do anything, you know? So that's an extreme example. But so, so we just said, uh, no, uh, the pleading conflicts with itself or whatever. And um, the court denied the motion, which is, it's okay. Okay. Because sometimes the judge says, hey, that's an interesting argument. I'd like to hear the case. And so they let the case go forward. And so what happens is, you bring up the motion again later in a different procedure. And I'll show you what I'm gonna what I did here. So uh so we did, but in the answer, I took the argument from the motion to dismiss, and in the answer, I denied every allegation. And I took my argument and I put it as an affirmative defense in the answer. So it's preserved. Because here's why. I I got my motion to dismiss denied. Now I can raise the issue again. I can make another motion to dismiss later. Instead, I can make another type of motion based on my affirmative defense, which is the same defense I made in my motion to dismiss. So it doesn't go away. <laughs> I just go and answer the complaint and I simply deny each and every allegation. And I'll tell you, I don't even read them. I just put deny, 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 deny. And then I go back and I put objections on some of them because there's some things you can object to, but I'm not going to get into that. So anyways, we go into the case, we go into discovery. What do you think is the first thing I ask for in discovery? You know, discovery. The proof to of the assessment. Yeah, show me uh, the assessment certificate. <laughs> Boom. Oh, and by, while we're at it, I want to see an assessment certificate that is by an assessment officer. I want his deposition. I want him to identify in the certificate. I want to see the type, kind, or class of tax. Because by the way, guys, and here's another revelation, if you don't know already, there is no such thing as an income tax. Go check your tax code, Title 26, at least 26, not 27, but 26. It's not defined. Go look in 26 USC 7701, where all the definitions are. Okay, say that again, you guys. Go go slower. Say it again, go John, look in for 26, everybody. 26 USC section 7701. You'll see all the definitions. Now, the tax code is to tax what? Income, right? Yeah. Why is that not defined? The one thing the entire collection of statutes is for to collect a tax on is not defined? Huh? No, they left it to the courts. The whole thing's a scam, as you know. The whole thing is but a I'm scam, everybody. I'm telling you it's a scam. And it's a scam in 400 different ways. I'm just telling you a couple of things in a you know 30-minute call here. So, I love it. So the, in order to tax people, which there are taxes, if I'm, if I'm drilling oil, if I'm ma manufacturing spirits, if I'm manufacturing weapons or explosive or hazardous, hazardous materials or uh, working for the Department of Transportation, uh, then I'm, I'm probably involved in a taxable activity. Mm -hmm. If I won, if I won something at casinos, probably taxable, right? These are all legitimately taxable things. So I want to know what one of them I'm being held liable for. And uh, just, just as an aside, the reason why I know this is because my first case I ever took in 1994 uh, was a gentleman who was a flower farmer and he made the, he made the flowers for the Macy's day parade. It was a season, he was a seasonal farmer. And he decided he was going to stop filing and argue with the government stuff. And it was a big mess. But anyways, what I had to do in his case was I had to pull his individual master file and discover what he was being taxed for. That was the only way I could beat his beat, beat the IRS in that case. In that case, I had to bring in the FBI, which is a crazy story. I never had to do that before or after. It was my first case, so I never had to do that after. But um, I, when I pulled his individual master file, I, I discovered that he was being taxed for manufacturing guns. Pistols and revolvers, as they call it, okay? So, of course, the remedy is to file a, a report to the FBI. It's under 7214, if you guys want to look it up. 7214 for the tax code. You'll see. Anyways, so that's why I knew this. So, so, I so wait a minute. Hold on. That's a really good story, too, because then what happened? The FBI, because he was, he was well, manufacturing flowers. What, okay, so the legal, the legal claim is that the, an officer of the United States government is attempting to collect more taxes than are owed in violation of 7214 and some other statutes, which gives rise to another executive agency to investigate the first one. So the FBI has to investigate the IRS, but you have to tell them. So I just wrote him a letter and I just sent him a copy of the tax record. And, and within 30 days, I never knew what happened after that. All I know is that within 30 days, they, they had taken every piece of property from his farm. They took his farming equipment, they took his cars, they were gonna sell his house and they gave it all back. They gave all his money back and he never heard from them again. Oh my gosh, John. Yeah, that's that, fantastic. That's, crazy, that's the craziest. That's an early, early, or back in the 90s. Oh, okay. my gosh. That's wonderful. So this helped me understand kind of the, the the whole system there. There's administrative. Administrative law is pretty helpful. Even though administrative 
The Administrative Procedures Act, okay, in Title V, Section 552A, this was this is the bankruptcy reorganization plan for the United States government. This is what happened uh, in 1933 when after the Great Depression or during it, mm -hmm. FDR um, reorganized the debt for the United States. And the way the way a, a sovereign government reorganizes its debt is it writes a law and follows the law. Mm -hmm. So it, it wrote an administrative procedure, which became our Administrative Procedures Act, which governs all the administrative agencies we're all dealing with right now, which is actually quite useful if you know what to do. It's very helpful. I mean, how do you handle this growing population with all these litigation things going on, right? Mm -hmm. So anyways, we're in discovery. I said, hey, you said it. Let me see it. You said there's an assessment. You said you assess it. Let me see. I love it. And let's schedule the, the de deposition of your assessment officer. I have every right to depose him and cross-examine his assessment certificate because the assessment certificate is testimony and I get to cross-examine him because you're relying upon it. Mm -hmm. It's the whole basis of the of the case. Yeah, you started it. Yeah. I, I mean, that's how I like to say it. You started it. You so said what happened? That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm just, again, we go back to the federal rules of civil procedure and we had to go a little bit further. So we get past the pleading stage, right? Because my motion to dismiss was denied. We go into discovery. Discovery is the middle third of a civil proceeding. The beginning th third is pleading, pleadings and practice. Pleadings practice. Complaint, answer, cross-claim, counterclaim. That's what it is. Then you get into discovery and then you get into pre-trial uh, pre motions, okay? Pre-trial motions would be something like a motion that would get rid of the case. We call these dispository motions. So you can bring up another motion to dismiss. You can you can even dismiss a case after you lost the case on jurisdictional grounds. There's even a rule for this. Wow. You can even file a motion to dismiss after you lost if you understand what you're doing on jurisdiction. But in this case, it was still in the, the discovery stage. So the way I like to do a case like this is I initiate discovery immediately with the same exact day I send an answer. Because what, what, the, what that allows me to do is control the time limits and the positioning of discovery. So that means I get to answer discovery last if they start discovery, which they didn't. The, the United States didn't do any discovery. Yeah. They figured they could just file a bunch of papers and the judge will help them out. He didn't, they didn't realize that the person that they were fighting actually read the rules, which he didn't, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Well, they had you and you read and yeah. you, you know them very yeah. well. So I know the rules. So, and they don't have an attorney. Yeah. And the attorney would have hurt them. He would they have. They would have. Yeah. Let's get into a payment plan. Well, I can do that with a phone call. I don't need you to, you know, pay you $10,000 to get me to a payment plan. And and let's not talk about liability, right? So yeah. so anyways, I said, where's the assessment and all that? So we get into discovery. I ask the questions first. That means I get to answer their questions last. The reason being is this. This is so important. If you're going to ask for the case to be thrown out after discovery, you can only do it when discovery is completed. If you file a motion to throw the case out, let's call it, I use the term throw the case out. I'm going to tell you in a second what that is. If you do that while discovering is still going on between the parties or there's objections and pending and all this sort of thing, the court will, as a matter of court uh, procedure, will deny your motion. Mm -hmm. so you have to be careful about when you're going to ask for that last, let's throw the case out. Yeah. And so what this looks like is this. This comes out of England back in the 16, 1600s. This was where... Uh, the courts realize that there's some cases that don't need to go to trial. And there's certain criteria for that. If it looks like there's no controversy, don't need to go to trial. If it looks like you're winning, no question, don't need to go to trial. This is known as summary judgment. You guys can look this up. It's summary judgment. If you look in the federal rules of civil procedure, it's rule 56, governs summary judgment. So I filed a, a motion for summary judgment. I knew they weren't doing discovery. So the moment I completed discovery that day, I asked for summary judgment. So there's no wiggle room. They don't have one day to file their motion first. And this is another thing you have to understand. If you file your motion for summary judgment first, if you file your dispository motion first, there's a very good chance you're going to get it granted. Many reasons why. There is already a prejudice against people that don't have lawyers, mm -hmm. but you can compensate for that by being a little you know, diligent and knowing knowing a couple of these things, which this is why we're Michelle's nice enough to have this you know discussion. Yeah. So uh, I filed the motion. Uh, actually, what what did we do? No, we were ready to file the motion, but before I before I filed that motion, I have to exhaust discovery. I have to finish. I can, I have to do as much as I can in discovery. So we got to that point where 
I, I said to them, and it, we, we're just doing email back and forth. And we don't waive service by email. So we, we, we coordinate things by email, but we send notices in the mail, just so you guys know. We don't do legal documents in the, in the email. You always do mail, first class mail. Never do e-filing and that nonsense, okay? Because you get all kinds of problems. So I, I was trying to coordinate a, a deposition for their assessment officer. Well, there isn't one. Yeah, that's right. There's no one. They didn't do it. There's none. <laughs> and they know it. Yeah. And they know we know it now. They know we know it. And this is cat and mouse game, right? So there so the first response from the DOJ's office is, okay, yeah, we can do a deposition. Uh what uh how about next month? Uh, bunch of liars. Yeah. Thinking, okay, oh this will be fun. Uh yeah, that's a good date. Let's do that date. And they're like, okay, yeah, let's do that date. So then they call they called the, the defendants on the phone and they said something like, hey, uh, why don't you withdraw the uh, deposition date? Just withdraw it. So, of course, she says, well, let me call you, get back with you on that. So she calls me up and she, and she just tells me, I said, they're just trying to get you to withdraw the date so they can ask for summary judgment. Oh, yeah. Because they're, they're, they're going to try to get the court, the judge to help them because they screwed up. They yeah. picked the wrong person to sue. That's literally what happened in this case. They sued wow. the wrong person. They're used to getting everything they want because mm -hmm. they don't, either don't know what they're doing or they hire a lawyer and the lawyer knows how to, how to sell out the client. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They're, they're, that's, how, that's what they're going to yeah. for. You guys know. So anyways, uh, once they realized that wasn't going to fly, they just withdrew the case. So we actually never got to file the motion for summary. I had it ready uh, for and timed properly but they just went ahead and quit and they did it again with prejudice so this time the money was on the table whether mm -hmm. if you lose this time meaning if you withdraw the case this time you don't get to collect anything at zero dollars and that yeah, affects that the state be. too if the state see the states they're not supposed to do this but they base if you have a state income tax they base it purely on your federal records and they're not supposed to but if your federal records show zero the state has to change its records to zero which is also the case. Nice. So I told him, go, go get a. Uh, so when the judgment came in, the judgment is the court, uh, well, the case is uh, withdrawn, meaning I won. And so that order, the, the judge orders it. Okay, uh, I'm going to agree with you guys. <laughs> if you want to dismiss the case, okay, fine. I'm the judge. Who am I to argue with you? <laughs> you know. And so he has to sign off on it is what they call it. Right, mm -hmm. sign it. So we take the judge's order dismissing the case, and get a certified copy of it. I told him just keep it in your records, and I'll just give you an aside. Part of the reason why I do that, I'll just repeat that. When you get an important order from a court, like you beat the government again, second time, you beat them, you That's get a big. certified copy of that order. That's a trophy. Get a certified copy of that order because nobody can argue with the genuineness of that order once it's a certified copy. Get a certified copy. It costs like a dollar, right? Because I've had a case, I had a similar case. Uh, well, it was a it was a state regulatory agency. It was the Department of Health in, in Florida, and uh, we beat them so bad when we got we had to go to the appeals court. We went to the appeals court, and they were going to be embarrassed very badly. And uh, they actually deleted the entire file all the way down to the administrative procedure, up to the appeals court. They deleted it as if it never existed before. They what? didn't even have the case number, so. I realized then, well, my client didn't need the record, but it, it would have been nice to have everything, you know, like an official version of it. I mean, we have all the documents, but it would be nice to have an official version. So when you have an important judgment like that, get a certified copy of it. Keep it in your, keep it in your vault for a while. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Frame it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Put I mean, it on you your know, mantle. You can just That's so fantastic. People. Yeah. Wow. So, so you can, you can beat them guys. If you understand rules of procedure, stop quoting the constitution, actually understand what's supposed to be done. So that you understand what they're supposed to do and what your rights are, all right? It's called due process. You guys talk about due process all the time, but you really don't know what it is. It's a property right. It's a property right. What? It, ex it existed long before the creation of the Constitution. When I quote, when I quote, when I cite that I have a due process right, what I say is, "Hey, I have a right to a fair and impartial hearing." I have a right to rely upon the rules of procedure. This is how I make the argument. I don't cite the Constitution. I never cite the Constitution because it doesn't apply to me. It applies to them. I just that's tell them, right. That's I had right. that right long before you guys existed. 
My parents had that right. My grandparents. In fact, because people had that right before you existed, we created you. We created the government because we had these rights. And guess what? We didn't waive them. That's fantastic, John. So this is wonderful. If you guys are watching, this is aceofcoins.com or listening on the Voice of Kona radio, 100.5 FM, aceofcoins.com, A-C-E-O-F-C-O-I-N-S.com. Go and visit him if you're having any issues. If you want to learn how to lower or li eliminate your taxes, this is this is the man to go to. Buy Bitcoin tax-free, all kinds of stuff uh, around related to, to tax issues, and as well as you also do uh, licensing of biometric data which is like you are you're you're like the man to go to who understands the enslavement that we've been in and the and the 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 tricks that are under their sleeves like up their sleeves I should say well, look at the the collection of your data if you want to just mention I just deal with property rights and and managing risk financial risk so we have private property rights people don't realize there's no personal property rights you have private property rights some are intangible some are not some are tangible but but when it comes to the collection of your your data like People just accept that you just go to the DMV and get your driver's license photo, and then they make fun of your photo. And you know, that's as far as it goes. But really what they're doing is collecting your biometric data. And you have to think about this. For, for centuries, people have been using biometric data to get around in the world, right? Mm -hmm. If you get hired at a job, right? And then like in 1970, you get hired at a job and you show up the next day to, the, to your boss to, to, to report for work. He knows who you are. He hired you, right? Mm -hmm. Why does he know who you are? Because he recognizes you. The difference between the collection of biometric data today is that it's a commodity now. It's being mm -hmm. collected, stored, and used without your consent or knowledge. And don't believe for a second the privacy statements. So all I do is I look at like a property right, just like my clients in the in the you know procedure and stuff, right? The audit and all this stuff. It's these are all property rights. Due process is a property right. It's also a fundamental right. So if if your data is being collected, just think for a second how much of your data Google has already. Yeah. Biographical data, your phone, SSN, address name. That's biographical. Biometric data is the aspect of your appearance that can be measured and that's unique to yourself. Like your eye color is unique to yourself. Your fingerprints unique. Every the biometrics of your face, from your cheekbones to your chin, your nose, all this is can be measured and, and calculated, right? And identifies you specifically. So because it's unique to yourself, like for example, an SSN is not unique to you. It's just a number. But yeah. when you connect it with your date of birth and your name, you got yourself a unique piece of data, right? Well, if you've got Google to uh, confess that it's collected your data and yeah, it's made money on your data. And then it said, we'll stop doing that for you. And it purged all its records, right? Let's just say hypothetically that Google did this, purged all its records of your biometric data and biographical data. The moment it did that, those records would be populated again because the collection of this information is so pervasive that Google can't even stop it. Yeah. You don't have a remedy. It's so pervasive. You don't have a remedy. So what you need to do is realize that the biometric data, the collection of it, because it's unique to you, it's property right. And if you're not making a claim on it, it's abandoned property. That's actually a legal term. Go look it up. What is abandoned wow. property? It's property that no one's made a claim on. Money is a claim, guys. Think about it. Money is not like that rectangular piece of currency or it's not a gold coin. It's a claim. It's a wow. claim. Yeah. So if you don't make a claim on your property and you're allowing, you are allowing everyone to use it and profit from it. Okay, you can do that. But you can also make a claim on it. So how do you make a claim on it? Describe it. And then you set the terms. So someone has your data, the way that uniform commercial code is works like this. Someone has your data, it's property. You describe it and then you record a lien against it, naming the collector of the data, the debtor. You you become the creditor. You become the secured party creditor. Now this is different than you guys talking about secured party creditors and all this uh, fictitious names. Don't do that stuff. What I'm talking about is a real security agreement that works just like a mortgage on your house. This is a mortgage that you're the lender for and that someone else is the debtor and you don't need him to sign for it because the UCC establishes the obligation just because you record the lien. Wow. So then what happens because you do that? Okay. So the way I like to look at, you can do it different ways. Here's what I like to do is you put a lien for like a few dollars uh, per fiscal quarter 
for taxable quarter every three months, right? You make your data worth, the collection of it worth a few dollars. You can make it whatever you want. I don't know of any benchmark, but just make up a number, okay? What I'm thinking is at some point, this financial obligation will become so big or big enough that it'll have to be reported on their SEC disclosures and to their investors and in their stock report. Because because they're not going to pay you. I mean... They will, but we'll get to that in a second. Okay, okay, go. I'm thinking is not to get paid. My thinking is to create a liability yeah. on their balance sheet that they have to disclose and account for and answer to and explain to their investors and insurance carriers and stock market and regulatory agencies. Do that first. Make it big. Okay, it's kind of like weightlifting. Build up your base then get, get your high number so you can talk about it, right? <laughs> All right, this is what we want to do. Build up your base. Put the liens. Okay. Each one of you should be doing 30, 40. I talked to somebody the other day. She goes, I need 120 of them at least. <laughs> File liens against everybody collecting your data. These will be all the brand name companies, your phone company, your oh utility, gosh. your GMB, your IRS, the TSA. You guys hate the TSA? You're giving them your data for free. Yeah. You're their best friend. Put a lien on it. Put a dollar amount. Uh, this is why I show people. I teach them how to do one. Okay. I teach you how to do one. Then it's off to the races. You can do it yourself. There, I know there's people out there that are teaching other people. I, I want that. I want others to show. So we get enough of these, right? What I'd like to do is put together a collection of my clients and form a company and acquire these liens, just like you would licensing rights to like, let's say song mu music, mm -hmm. right? Songwriting, lyrics or whatever. Acquire the rights to all these liens. Mm -hmm. And then you have a balance sheet that was worth tens of millions of dollars. What, what kind of financing can you get for that? Wow. What would you do with that financing? I would do more freedom actions. I think so. I, would, I keep going, man. That's so, what you know I'm what? Thinking. I love this. I love this. <laughs> I love actions. Uh, and so if you guys are watching, you can uh, aceofcoins.com, but also standtogetherhawaii.com because I'd love to do this action with the people I already have on my list. This is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so I mean, we, we got to think yeah. of that. But yeah, so those two cases, it's all about the procedure. Okay. Learn what's going on and what's supposed to happen. And what their obligations are. Yeah. So this has been wonderful. So much, so much mahalo to you for this. My my last question is: the stock market just took a tumble, and uh, what are your thoughts right now on what's okay. going on so in the economy? My partner is an insider on all this stuff, so he's calling me on the phone laughing today. He goes, he, we, "In fact, we were going to do an interview. We were going to talk about something interesting today." And he said, "I can't, man. I got all these people calling me." They're his clients and they're all worried. And I said, what do you mean all mm -hmm. these people? He goes, well, really, out of all my clients, 15% of them are calling me in a panic. And these are the these are the ones with the smaller amounts of money that they don't understand what they're doing. They, they just mm -hmm. think that they could put their money somewhere and they're watching the stock market every day. Yeah. So he, he's laughing and he goes, John, I, I, I have all these accounts, all these subscriptions that he logs into and he's seeing how the major money around the planet is moving. He's looking at... Uh, you know, he's looking at all these uh, big uh, Black, Blackstone, BlackRock, BlackRock, mm -hmm. all these companies, right? He says, their money ain't moving anywhere. It's, oh. just, news. it's just news and they're just scaring people. So they make love to put fear into us. Yep. And he, and, he, and he and I both were laughing and we go, well, it's time to buy more stock. He goes, yep, it's time to buy more. It's a fire sale. Start buying more. If you made a good purchase based on solid numbers, okay, you look at a balance sheet, you said, okay, this is a good purchase. What do you care what the stock market does? Buy the damn stock. And when the price goes down like that because stupid people hear news and react to it. Which they've done all the way through the COV. Buy, buy on the way down, buy progressively less on the way up, and then wait. Keep on doing that. And you'll get richer while everybody else loses, squanders their, their cash. So yeah, we we're so that if you if you must know what were there what were the things okay there's a, there's a war looming with Iran and our Israel right uh, there's the AI phenomenon which you guys should know that this is coming yeah. I mean I went to Steak and Shake the other day and there was no cashier no waitress what it was just a kiosk and I always act like I don't know how to use the kiosk so they were nice enough to show me and stuff uh, yeah th th there's a big there's a big monitor in the front there's like four or five of them actually. And if you want something, you just go there and start typing in. You know, there's pictures because maybe they think you can't read or maybe pretty soon nobody can read. They're just That's pressing true. pictures, right? It's all pictures. And so you order what you want and then you pay with a credit card or something. If you have cash, they have a machine for that too. Oh, but they're still taking cash. That's good. Yep. But there's no cash, a cashier, and there's no waitress at all. 
there's people working in the back. And when your meal's ready, they'll bring it up to you and they call you. Wow. So uh, the AI was announced. And so a lot of people panic over that. The, the, the job market is, you know, I mean, it's getting rid of labor. That's why they wanted people to vote for the $15 an hour or the higher wages, right? Because they weren't going to have them anymore. What a nasty Jesus. trick. You guys should have seen this coming when you're talking about, yeah, I'm going to get more money per hour. No, you're not going to have a job. You should see that coming. <laughs> so what do you think, what can people do? Well, if you're, if you like buying, you know, public, uh, public equity, buy some, buy some more. When the, when you see the price come down like that, buy some more. If you know what you're doing, if you're buying and you know what you're buying and you're intelligent about it, you're not just having someone else buy it for you, buy for a reason that you bought on the quality aspects of this company. Do just buy more. And who cares about a day of event, an event? Mm -hmm. you, what are you doing? Gambling? Because if you're buying stock and selling it in a short period of time, you're you're gambling. Yeah. You're gambling. It's more fun. Correct me if you think I'm wrong. It's more fun. If you like to gamble, play blackjack and go to a local casino. You'll have way more fun. And you'll lose you'll lose money slower <laughs> if you follow basic strategy. Really. If you're going to be in the stock market, buy the company for the quality of the company. Buy for the balance sheet. Like a grocery store, buy those. Someone asked me yesterday, what's a good investment? You know, I said, well, I just went to get my oil change yesterday. I told them I buy up the five minute oil change place. Why? Because that's the future. That, yeah. They're not it going ain't away. Tesla, by the way. The future of cars is going to be what you see right now. It's the why, why do you say that? I love that because I, my book, Great Mary, Mary Langrab talks all about electrical cars and, and everything. There's a lot of reasons why electric cars, the way they're being made today, is not the future. You can have electric cars. I mean, our cars are mm -hmm. almost electric anyways, but the future is liquid fuels. It's still gasoline. It's still diesel. And there might be other versions of it, like more uh, cleaner fuel, like uh, methane, mm -hmm. or using a liquid fuel that this isolates hydrogen on demand and makes energy that way, but it's going to be liquid fuels. That's mo by far the most efficient fuel you can have. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good to know. Okay, John, any last things you want to share? I, I just thank you so much for your time today. I could stay on another hour, but uh, I yeah, also got to so get much. to my and, own uh, farm work. I hope that helps your audience. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it's just an example. You don't have to get pushed around. Just understand what you're dealing with. Read the rules. Read the rules. How many of you get stuff, furniture from the store and you don't read the instructions on how to put it together until you break something, right? Yeah, until it doesn't it work matter. out or you have an extra part that you're not supposed to have. <laughs> read the rules. Read the rules. You'll, you'll do far better. I love it. And they want you. <laughs> they want you. They, they, these people, are, they, don't, they don't tell the truth. They expect you to be yeah. ignorant. So if you have any questions, aceofcoins.com, he's there to help you. And I just want to say so much mahalo for joining. And let's do a quick prayer because that's what, what this is all about too. Infinite intelligence of all things, you are moving the sun and you're moving the tides in the ocean and you're beating our hearts right now and you're pumping a gallon of blood through our body per minute. And we don't have to ask you to do it. We don't have to have a to-do list to do it. It is all being done for us. We are totally taken care of, and our kuleana, our job, is to follow our inner guidance and do what is ours to do, what we are inspired in spirit, inspired to do through the infinite intelligence that you are, Great Spirit. We know that we are moving, this world is moving toward a better place of peace and of freedom and of harmony and of unity, and we just send so much gratitude right now to John J. Singleton, to Ace of Coins, for all the people around the world that they have helped. He has helped and his team has helped. He's absolutely changed lives and he keeps doing it every single day. And we just give so much gratitude to his higher self that said, yes, I'm going to go to earth at this time in history and I'm going to play my part in this game of life. We just send him so much mahalo from the islands of Hawaii, and knowing that he is always kept safe and always guided to his kuleana, whatever his it is, whatever is his to do. And right now, Grace Spirit, we just know that anybody listening to this message, that they feel that spark of hope, that things can be better for them in their lives and also for the world as a whole together. And we know, Great Spirit, that those people who do not honor and value human life, 
are peaceably removed from office or we get to watch the game as they voluntarily step out of power. It is already done, Great Spirit. We get to wake up every single day knowing the world is a better place for our children, for our keiki, and for ourselves. And we know it is done, Great Spirit. We are so grateful. So much mahalo. And so it is. John, thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you again soon. And again, aceofcoins.com, you guys. Much aloha. <laughs>